thank you for such a lovely introduction. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's just lovely. So truly, Sean, thank you. And and all of you, I'm so happy to see you here. And please do turn on your cameras so I can see you. It's always a little bit uncomfortable just to see names and not faces when you're giving a talk. It's like being in front of an audience that is not looking at you. <laughs> so um, those who have turned on your, your video, your cameras, thank you so much. And those who have not, please consider turning them on so I can see you and, and feel comfortable here. Thank you. I thought about what we would talk about or what I would introduce today for an open discussion. And um, something just came up, uh, but there's a broad spectrum of ideas I'd like to discuss with you all because as visual, visionary, creative uh, producers that you all are, you're right on the, the cutting edge of what the future will become. There is nothing more profound than storytelling, whether it's done through the written word or the visual image or in a game or in a real-time performance piece or whatever the modality of delivery is, is secondary to the fact that creative ideas are what helps make society grow and advance and um, develop a, a sense of self-respect, self-acknowledgement. And without that, we become sequestered to an, like an authoritarian world where we don't have that, that sense of freedom of, of creation. So you are very well placed um, to be the thinkers of of change basically and there always will be change and always needs to be change yesterday i was in my weekly studies group which everyone here is welcome to join uh, if you just email me i'll add you to the list our topic was dementia and looking at why is it that dementia is proposed by uh, the world health organization and other organizations that look at statistics and growth of the world populace. Dementia is considered to be developing at a faster rate than before, that it will triple by 2050. And while there are say 50 million people in the world today with dementia, and dementia is an umbrella term for all the different diseases of the brain or cognition, that it will really certainly advance again three times that. And that is worrisome. So the first thing we do is we ask three questions. First off, has it always been like this and just wasn't reported before because we didn't have great ways for uh, assessing uh, public health around the world? Two, is it because of the baby boomers, the older population, people now approaching 50, 60, 70, especially 70 and 80 of the baby boomers? <clears throat> is that all of a sudden come to a gestalt um, and a threshold? And thirdly, is it because life extension people are, are supposedly living longer, which um, was a little bit interrupted by COVID-19, but still it, it's back on track with people living healthier and longer. But healthier is not just in the body, it's also in the brain. So yesterday we studied dementia and, and what is it and what could cause it. And there was a particular gene um, that has a protein that has been identified as causing dementia. And while there is hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in longevity today, um, not, not only in um, sequencing the full human genome, but also in looking at stem cell therapies and genetic engineering, CRISPR-Cas9, for example, and looking at you know, fighting cancers, which is such a big deal today, um, heart disease and diabetes, and looking at malaria and the diseases that still are, are very strong in various of the 
various of the 55 countries in Africa, for example, these are all big issues for health. Why isn't the brain the most important area for us? <clears throat> so we discussed that and um, it was a very creative discussion <clears throat> in that we researched this particular protein. It's called beta amygdala. Uh, and then we discovered that that was based on false information, potentially, that that particular protein, the beta amygdala, what may not have been authentic, that may be the universities, the research schools wanting to get the grants were pushing this out a little bit before it's time so that more grant money going to it. And we hear these stories quite frequently where a an institution, a university or another type of institution will push out particular worldviews and then they get a lot of funding from various governments around the world and uh, in, in the uh, private sector as well to further uncover. So that's always very alarming to me when I'm doing you know, research with students and all of a sudden we're going, wait a minute, this may not be actually true, that this protein that was identified some years ago may not be the cause of dementia. I bring that up because this morning I was, every day I, I take a look and see how many mentions my work gets in academic publications and books and articles and whatnot. And I, I came across one and it really was shocking to me. And I'm gonna use this as an example before um, we get into what transhumanism actually is and why it's so important today. I read this piece and it said, you know, you were mentioned in, in, I read the abstract for it. I didn't read the piece, I read the abstract because you just get the abstract. And I went, what the hell is going on? This is so wrong. The premise of the, of the um, contribution, I think it's an essay. I don't think it's a book. Um, but anyway, um, it was so awful to look at that it reminded me of how awful people must feel when there's prejudice against them and bias against them. Um, when we have the other not being respected or the disabled or the queer or the, the trans or the, um, the old or the too young or the too fat or the too thin, when with all these criticisms about people individually. And that's how I felt. I, I felt horrified by this article and I'll tell you what it said. In the abstract, it said that transhumanism is an unethical approach. Mind you, this was written by a philosopher at a university in Istanbul. She said that transhumanism um, is infringing on the rights of women. It's an anti-feminist movement, that it disregards reproduction, um, it, it um, disregards sexuality, it, um, and, and I don't need to say any more, do I? <laughs> I think that gets it across. Okay. I've always been a feminist. I'm in my 70s. I've been a feminist since I was in a teenager, um, before I even knew what it was. I always thought that women's rights were important um, in my era when I grew up. I remember saying, if there's another man that tells me what to do, I'm going to scream. You know, it was my minister, my teachers, the president, the mayors, the, all the officials, all everyone everywhere, um, telling me who to be and how to do it. I had brothers whose university was paid, but my father didn't think I needed to go to school. So I remember I worked as a waitress and I sold my blood and I you know, did whatever it took to pay for my undergrad school as a young woman at 19 years old. Bottom line here, reading something like that was horrifying to me because the whole reason I wrote the Transhuman Manifesto and built it into the Transhumanist Manifesto is because of my own life experience, not based on what I'd read someone else did or what I heard about someone else doing. Um, I was always a pure artist in that sense that I wanted my work to be original. And I think that's the value of the artist. You want your, you know, you are the originator of your ideas and that's precious to me. So no one influenced me in that regard. I wrote the transhuman early statement which became the, tra the Transhumanist Manifesto, because I almost died. I was very ill and I've died with 
was dying in pregnancy. My baby had died and was killing me. It's called an ectopic pregnancy. It's very dangerous for women and it still occurs. So I had that experience. Then um, I remember I went through infertility late in life in my late forties and I wasn't successful. I always wanted children. And that was something very precious to me. And I've always been for women's um, respect for women. Let's just say, I don't want to say rights because we do have rights, but it's <laughs> uh, not everywhere on the earth to be sure. But, you know, I've always stood up as, as a woman. So reading this by this philosopher at this university in Istanbul, Turkey, was so insulting to me this morning. And I thought there has to be something of importance to that. I, I I think that there's a connectivity in, in, in our world and what we do. And I'm here with you today. And I wanted to share that, that when we're, we're academics and we're scholars, but first we're, we're creators and in creating, we must always create reality um, or the, the virtual realities or the visions that we have with integrity. And I, this philosopher who wrote that lacks integrity because there's nothing further from the truth about transhumanism. It is not anti-reproduction. It is not anti um, of new life. And the reason that was said is because the transhumanists in my work, especially, I've talked about we need to move beyond gender distinctions. Um, the sexuality will change over time, which it obviously has uh, over the last hundred years, last you know fifty years, um, and. Uh, that um, there can be new types of reproduction, new types of, I would have liked to have, have survived my um, um, life-threatening um, situation. So it showed me that this philosopher did not do her due diligence and was intentionally trying to paint transhumanism as this awful uh, thing, which it is not. And I, I can understand why people think that way because um, there is so much hypocrisy in the world and um, opinions um, that largely stem from certain belief systems that are opposed to the future and opposed to technology and opposed to human evolving and the cyborg or post-human or any of these different modalities that we could take on. I understand that change is, is very difficult. However, to blame it on a particular worldview philosophy like transhumanism is, is absolutely incorrect. So I did respond to this person this morning and I, I just said, dear so-and-so, your abstract, I read your abstract, it is misleading, it is um, full of uh, 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 mistruths and it's, it's just downright wrong. I said, you could have interviewed a woman who's a transhumanist and asked. And you would have gotten a direct answer and had a live quote and some viable information in your paper. So I, I will deal, deal with that university because I think that type of misinformation is so wrong to do. She could have said, in my opinion, this is what's going on, or it seems to me this is what's going on. But she said it as a, if it were a blatant fact. And that's one thing that is really important for us all to remember that when we're criticizing others and we're used to having critiques because that's what is in the world of, of creatives, of arts, no matter what field of the arts and design and visionary work you're in, we like to critique each other. And that's great. And it's wonderful to be critiqued. But to downright out misinform through a disdain is, is bad. So that's one of the reasons I created the Center for Transhumanist Studies, because this is nothing new to me. This has been going on for a while. And I want to open up the uh, our discussion here so that you can ask me questions and I can give you honest answers. Um, since the term transhumanism is gaining even far more mileage than I expected at this time, it's it's if, you know, it's the movement started in the early 1990s. I wrote the manifesto in 1982, um, had a TV show on it in Los Angeles, um, you know, started speaking about it, talking about, you know, the future human, et cetera, and looking at, of course, the post-human and, and cyborg and all of that as well. But it seemed to me that transhuman was where we are at today. 
um, and even you know, 30 uh, years ago, we're still in that, that stage um, as we're you know adapting and, and, and changing the world around us and ourselves. Um, the, uh, but in the 1990s, it was a far-fetched idea. And then 2000 came around and then people got very afraid of it with genetic engineering. And, you know, we want to be perfect and engineer ourselves and all this stuff that's really extreme thinking and, and really off the topic of transhumanism. No one looks for perfection. It's a, and it's a misnomer. And I've said that many times, but we do want to live longer and healthier. I mean, who doesn't? Uh, and if you don't, that's your choice. But why restrict people who do? And um, so here we are today in 2023, and transhumanism is still being misrepresented. In any case, um, in 2020, I, I opened the Center for Transhumanist Studies, and I've been teaching it. I had already been teaching it at universities, as, as Sean had, had said. But you can see it here. This is the homepage for it. And there is a basic introduction. And what I tried to do in the introduction is to really lay out what it is, how it started, that you know, what it really is beyond the hyperbole written by academics in their uh, social sciences and humanities departments, um, and also the journalists who like to create a, a tremendous amount of hyperbole. Um, so you can say what the aim you can see, I'm sorry, you can see what the aim of it is here. Provide a program for lifelong learning that is immediate, accessible, and continually updating. And that's one of the core views within transhumanism as a, a way of being and as a philosophy that um, knowledge changes and we need to change with knowledge. That we, it, it's, it's very advantageous for us to continually be learning and finding out where we may be going into a dogmatic, approach and where we can continue expanding our knowledge to better understand the advances ahead. Um, the more information we're getting from the telescope about our universe and the different solar systems and the different worlds to potential for life out there somewhere to the molecular, the nanoscale, the atomic scale of information that we keep on uncovering about the, the interconnectivity of life, the, um, the planet and the rhizome of information and knowledge to what is consciousness, which we still don't know. And some of the world's leading philosophers such as David Chalmers or Daniel Dennett and others still say, there's so many theories on what consciousness really is, we still don't know. Maybe one day we will, but currently it's theoretical. So I have all that included in this. And there are two courses, the introduction, which is it has a lot of videos and, and reading references and whatnot to the knowledge accelerator. And I turn that into my real time and virtual Friday every week uh, with a different topic. And people come from all over the world and we discuss issues at hand, such as on Friday, we discuss dementia and uh, why is it increasing in the world? And why aren't the millions of dollars that are going into looking at um, biomedical interventions to disease, focusing on, on um, the cognitive sphere more and more? So here you have some of the students. She's from Sweden. She stayed with me here. Uh, and she was working on her master's degree on transhumanism and with a focus on me. So I said, just come to, you know, come here and we got along so well, she ended up staying. Um, and then here's two very well-known artificial general intelligence computer scientists who are really at the cutting edge of AI. That's Ben Gertzwell who developed the robot Sophia and programmed the um, computer language in it. And that's Peter Voss who is an artificial intelligence um, entrepreneur who the two of them coined the term artificial general intelligence with a third person and uh, artificial general intelligence is the future of artificial intelligence that is if and when it gains sapience and sentience or self-awareness or consciousness so here's um, this here is um, Martine Rothblatt and her wife Bina Bina also um, was um, uh, there was a robot based on Bina 4, if you, anyone saw it, it was on the cover, I think Time Magazine or Newsweek Magazine. So Bina 4 
um, Bina works with it to increase its AI system. And Martine Rothblatt, she is an entrepreneur who created Sirius Radio, and um, she's now developing 3D printed lungs. And she is one of the leading, um, I would say, CEOs in the United States. She was the highest paid CEO in, I think it was 2021, woman, female um, CEO. Um, and so these are two very benevolent, altruistic individuals who give so much to others in the world. And here are the uh, um, the reading. I just had this. This is my book, The Transhumanist Reader, and which has 70 um, plus different authors who are really knowledgeable about transhumanism, their papers, their seminal papers on transhumanism. And this was a great article in Wired magazine in 2000, The Future Gets Fun Again, uh, where I was featured. And this is an um, ethical transhumanist. Um, this is at the Institute for Art and Ideas outside of London. And so these are really, I think, three uh, important pieces. But the course, we can go into different structures on it, but I just wanted to bring this up to you and um, discuss a couple of things. Now I'm going to show a PowerPoint just briefly um, that ties in innovation and why I think transhumanism and innovation are um, important for us. This is a project I'm working on with um, in Africa and largely South Africa. It's an academic program where we're talking about innovation and also with Nigeria and Ethiopia. And I chose to work with uh, these countries in Africa because I think they're cutting edge. I think that um, there, there is such a hunger and thirst for creativity and philosophy and new ideas and ways to deal with the world because um, even though Africa is well established in many of its countries, many of the 55 countries, um, there is a still a hunger for um, better information than what is being delivered. And also because our, um, our species, if you're an evolutionary theorist, which I am, um, arrived out of Africa. And I'll be speaking at a conference there this month in a few weeks at the Cradle of Humankind. And if you haven't been to the Cradle of Humankind, Kind, it is amazing. It's outside um, Johannesburg, South Africa, in the bush a bit, and it, it is a museum that shows the artifacts, the the um, the bones of the skeletal system of early early hominids and hominids. So it is quite wonderful. Um, and mm -hmm. so, in this project, why is transhumanism um, relevant for innovation? And I think that it's because the scope of transhumanism is so large, it, it deals not only with humanity, of course, but society and human rights and looking at um, equities across systems and belief systems largely. And the ecology, which has always been important to transhumanism, that's the, the um, interactivity with all life forms, uh, the economics that uh, free markets are probably probably the still the best way to go um, when looking at um, fair competition uh, while bringing down the large um, manipulators or uh, monopolies, very important to, um, to be watch out for those. And the political sphere, um, not politics necessarily, but how the political sphere influences most of what we do uh, in life the issues of our privacy being consequential to our identity, our health without our bodies and minds. Um, we're not here, so always be healthy. The policy making, who's regulating our laws, um, existential risk or existence risk. Um, why has existential risk gotten so much mileage in various sectors um, and so afraid of AI to, um, big data, investment, genomics, the issue now of supercomputers, especially with AI and GPT-4 and now looking at GPT-5 and what some of the larger um, um, corporations and businesses are doing and how do we make sure that the free market 
is balanced out in that regard. And uh, indeed, transportation and the current um, direction towards vertical lift systems, flying cars, if in other words, as really coming um, uh, forward. And what does that mean for us with, with even the grid of how we communicate going this way rather than linear? So we'll see more vertical lift systems and how will that change our perspective uh, rather than the linear system and the chronological system of you age and you go along these years until you stop living or you get old enough that you can't function well anymore. The vertical lift system is an interesting metaphor um, for how we need to think exponentially rather than linearly, uh, linear, with linearity, I should say, that's probably better parsing of words. So it's interesting that even the issue of, of maybe transportation or communication is really affecting our, our logic, our, our, our sense of reality, because again, it's been this way or that way, and now it's going out. Um, this is uh, a course that I was uh, teaching and um, at the University on Strategic Innovation. And I put this in here because I think that there's some very basic things when we're innovating that are so important to us. It's not just the trying to get money. You know, everyone now is an entrepreneur or an influencer or has their project and they wanna get the angel investor or the venture capitalist behind them to, you know, and then make their money we ought not to forget the creative aspect of it. And what are we sharing with society? What are we informing? What message are we trying to deliver? And that, you know, it's it, it, that if that is powerful enough, the money will be there for it, but that's not good enough. You really have to know social media and marketing and how to pitch your idea. So even though we want it to be, um, the creative to be at the forefront, how we pitch it or market it is the, having those skills or those skill sets are very fundamental today because of the the uh, the entrepreneurial sphere and the, like Shark Tank on TV and everything is now a Shark Tank where innovators will pitch their ideas and then they have to show a minimum viable product. They have to have a proof of concept and a if not a working functional prototype, at least a, an image or um, an essay type theoretical proposition that is, is solid. So here I, um, Feynman, if you haven't read Feynman's work, I suggest it because um, starting at the bottom, the principle of applied knowledge, this is in relation to nanotechnology or molecular manufacturing. Uh, Richard Feynman uh, was, is known for the phrase, you know, at the bottom, there's plenty of room at the bottom, meaning that on the molecular scale, at the atomic scale, there's so much going on that we can't even see that it just is a reminder to us that as things are happening and changing in the world, we don't see all of this, but we need to be aware that it is happening. And um, certainly we do not have nanotechnology today as it was envisioned by Eric Drexler at MIT when he wrote his, his thesis, his doctorate thesis on nanotechnology and engines of cre creation. But we're, it's going in that direction where we're looking at the circuitry and microchips and genomics. And um, again, on the atomic level, being able to move matter is something that will be occurring uh, this century. Um, and then MIT review competing billion dollar tech companies uh, joining forces and to look at that, even though big tech has often um, achieved a, a, a lot of criticism, that's good. And to see where the, the smaller groups are within that and what they're doing and how they're innovating. So never turn, you know, turn away from just because it says big corp or, you know, whatever, that there may be elements of great potentiality or opportunities there. Um, here, uh, I'm sorry, that's a little bit blurred. So this is your basic futurist uh, assessment of looking at the scope of where you're innovating. Always consider the threats as well as the opportunities. And within this sphere, it's again, a balanced thing. There's always going to be threats or changes or obstacles to overcome and always opportunities opportunities, new ways of seeing things. So the main thing is asking questions to understand what drives 
the, the diversity, the knowledge, the education, who are the stakeholders, the students, the professors, the faculty, the teachers, your community, your groups, the galleries, museums, your audience, who are you speaking to? And be able to see um, where the, the, the complexity is and what are the goals driving this? And to be able to look at this with agility and observing what you're doing and how it is this uh, a system of uh, particulars is really important within the innovators uh, sector. And also the, the um, science of design, the symbols and narratives and visuals that influence us, even when we're not paying attention, they are typically are, are give, sending messages. It's like the unspoken message that is depicted in what we hear or what we see or how we feel our reaction to the world around us. Um, the fear and also activism are very closely linked as well as hope and anxiety. And the philosophical, religious and spiritual realms over here. Um, and they do affect society and beliefs. So on one hand, you have the symbols and narratives and the language unspoken or spoken. We also have how we interpret it in our philosophies, our worldviews, our religious views, also our belief system. And while that is all going on, there is the, in culture, there's the ethics. Someone says, I'm ethical, you're not. Well, <laughs> by what measure are you ethical and I'm not, or I am and you're not? So by what systems of measurement do we determine what's ethical and not ethical? Um, and how we market it to consumers, how that all this stuff is being told in culture of what to do and what not to do, what's right, what's wrong, and a lot of binary thinking there, which, uh, as we know, is is kind of is a div divisive way of thinking. Down to the arts and science, the the where the the system is heading with virtuality and simulation and biosynthetics, and how we can in, interpret all these these practicalities and use of knowledge within their various systems to better translate what our innovation or creative project is to uh, looking at where the connective intelligence is located. Um, okay, then th th a lot of the technology deals with humans as well as animal species uses of tools. Well, we all know this and that technology has been around forever. And we, that's identified, especially at the cradle of humankind where you can see the tools that the earliest um, hominids used, um, the Australopithecus, to the um, bipolar eds and the Neanderthals to the Homo erectus and the, the humans themselves. So what in society um, is marking um, identity and whatnot? And what's interesting here is I was watching a, a program on the first humans, it's a PBS and BBC kind of collaboration that the we used to think that the earliest humanoids were not intelligent like we are because we developed language and music and mathematics and, and whatnot, but we're finding out that the, early, the Neanderthals were more intelligent than we thought. And that's kind of interesting to take a look back at how they communicated without the formation of unarticulated mathematics and language. I love to have mind maps and to see how everything is, is interconnected. So I just have some examples of mind maps that I use when I'm talking about transhumanism and humanity's future and looking at what we might become and how to integrate all the levels of intelligent sensibility plus creativity, how one, one aspect leads to another. And this I use on a daily basis. Um, I work with teams sometimes and sometimes solo, but I, there's so many different groups I work with that I really enjoy um, working with teams um, and looking at what's happening like in Africa. I work with three separate teams there, one in Ethiopia, one in Nigeria, and one in South Africa. Uh, with AI, I work with several different teams. I, I I'm the founder of the H plus DAO. So that brings me into the decentralized um, system of, of what happens with smart contracts and cryptocurrency and these decentralized organizations and how do you build them out and what is that all about? It's a very complex area. So I've got a great team at SingularityNet 
that I work with, and also re I received the grant from Deep Funding for the DAO, D-A-O, again, Decentralized Organization, Autonomous Organization. So um, the decentralized topic is really spreading. There are more and more organizations that are becoming decentralized, and there's something now called open longevity, open science, and there's also decentralized science, D. E-S-C-I, and more and more institutions, whether academic and otherwise, are starting to take on this decentralized approach to creativity, to knowledge, to research. And that is really great because I think through that, some of this misinformation that's being espoused, whether it's on what protein in a gene is causing dementia, which again, is lacking the, the credibility that it once had, uh, or misinformation about your, your personal work or your, your belief system that someone else is, is dismissing, like what I experienced this morning from that a professor at the university in Istanbul. Um, that was like another annoyance. <laughs> you know, we get these all the time when, when we're misquoted or misunderstood in the work that we're doing. So it's really important that we have this de decentralized information um, to better assess uh, levels of efficacy in information that's being dispu um, disputed and dispersed. Every innovation or creative project has a design strategy framework. It, whether we create a form for it or think about it or just do it, there's always a project action plan. Again, whether you're in your studio or uh, out in nature, wherever you're having a creative idea, there's always that interactive, iterative process process where you have an idea and then you build on it and you build on it and you change it and you you pivot and but as long as we keep um a, you know an eye on what the goal is um it will the framework seems to be more consistent and maybe that's not your approach maybe you want a total uh disruptive um, and that would be fine too. Maybe you had a disruptive framework and a disruptive action plan, a disruptive innovative or iterative process. That's good too. But what I'm saying here is, you know, think about it and structure it out as an architect or engineer too, because uh, that will make things and life a lot easier. Another thing I, I use a lot is storyboard when I come up with an idea, whether it's a future body design or building out a course, I like to um, see how it's going um, with um, I, um, a prototyping storyboard. And I think I love this so much because I was a filmmaker and videographer and, you know, a storyboard is really helps put things in its place and it helps you see the theme, uh, the continuity of the theme, even during the iterative processes. And, um, the, in my work, it's all about the technology, technological advancement and the human potential um, transformations and how this goes across the various sectors. Again, humanity, society, ecology, economics, political, transportation, education, communication. And with all these areas, the, there are stakeholders and you are a primary stakeholder. You, you know, you're not just the producer or the creator, you also have a, a stake in it. And um, that's important to make sure that it's all included and uh, paid attention to. And as the internet keeps on advancing and we have the metaverse and you know GPT-4 and you know, I'm sure most of you have played with GPT-4, it's a lot of fun. Um, you, know, you give it some information, say, okay, create a story about this or create my biography or autobiography or whatever. It's really interesting to see how fast and precise it is. Um, yeah, there are some glitches which are called um, hallucinations in the computer science world when um, uh, programming such as GPT-4 makes a mistake. It's called a hallucination. Um, however, the computer scientists who are really knowledgeable about the advances in AI programming, C++ or Python or whatever format is being used for programming, say it's not a hallucination at all. It's just simple bullshit. So that even the AI can create BS and we have to be very careful. So that brings us to the, 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 the section on why I think transhumanist studies is so important because a fundamental principle within this process or practice of transhumanism is that to keep on questioning yourself and your work that you're doing and look for the, the, the most accurate knowledge or um, 
reliability in espousing information and even creative information, uh, especially during a time where there's so much mi misinformation. And I know that's like a boring old world word that um, keeps on being pushed out, but it's it's really true. There's so much opinion and and so little evidence or reliability. So many papers and articles being written on hearsay or opinion rather than research or empirical knowledge. And it's that empirical knowledge gained from empirical research, which really does show the viability or efficacy of creative ideas, whether in, in writing or other formats. So I think that one of our responsibilities today is to be as creative as, as possible with liberty, with the freedoms that, that are needed to create uh, while being mindful that of the, the various sectors of the world that are part of the stakeholders within our sphere of influence. And that's all I have to say right now. And I'd love for you all to challenge me or ask me questions or engage me in any way you want. Oh, well, these people haven't turned on their, you're being scolded. Okay. So if you have a question, just raise your hand or speak up and. Uh... Uh, yes, Rayoshini, Rayoshini, Payoshini. Uh, yeah, Pay Hi, thank, thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, it was really inspiring. And I also really like that uh, you led with like some personal examples because I feel like it's it's always really nice to be able to connect like someone's personal life with their research, not in a biographical way, but just to see like what really makes people take what, what really inspires people. But um, I think th the question that I had is probably like, political as much as it is um, technical or technological. Um, one of the, and I, I'd probably give some background for it if, if that's okay. Um, one, uh, I, 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 I recently finished my master's and um, there's, there's two broad tendencies in digital humanities. One is to be critical of computation technology, et cetera, because it's uh, a medium for control, surveillance, um, et cetera. And the other is obviously what we're trying to do is like chart alternatives and, <clears throat> and sort of see the potential for it, uh, potential that it has for a different kind of future. Um, and Obviously, I, I'm interested in the latter, which is why I'm a, a, a part of this. Um, but when when you said that um, when it comes to something like big corporations and the things that they innovate, we need to be able to see the potential in that as well. And kind of, I, I think I think that the, the thing that confuses me or a question that uh, bothers me all the time is just that it's just that empirically speaking July was like the hottest month uh, ever apparently and it seems to me that like even when we chart these alternatives um are, are we like being politically militant enough I mean are we do we need to be um do we need to be more militant in some way in order to actually um appropriate these this potential and have an alternative um and so I, I guess my only question is how do we be how how do we how can we be politically militant enough to actually realize these alternatives because it seems to me that like currently computation and tech uh, at a at a larger scale is still the prerogative of these people at least when it comes to like, the larger world. Um, yeah. Okay, let me make sure I understand you correctly. So you're saying in July, uh, um, we on Earth experienced the hottest temperatures ever in the history of, in the history, uh, historically, and um, 
then you had then you talked about the big corporations and the computerization so the connection is that the the possibility that these corporations are causing the the heat that is affecting the whole planet is that what you're is that the correlation I, um, I, I guess what I'm saying is that um, I, I guess what I'm saying is that um, in trying to sort of appropriate the potential of technology for the future, mm -hmm. um, I wonder if uh, I wonder what I mean, I wonder if we'd be politically militant enough is what I'm okay. saying. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. So first off, the um, I also saw that in in print around that this is the hottest ever in the history of the earth. Well, that's a fallacy right there. So doing our due diligence right off the bat, how do we know what went on 100,000 years ago? I mean, you know, who was there and reported it? I mean, is it carved in stone? This is the hottest? Did they have thermometers or, you know, thermostats back then? Um, so that's an assumption based on probably the scholarship of certain archaeologists and meteorologists and experts in weather and climate. Um, we don't know if it was the hottest day. I think it was probably a lot hotter when the asteroid hit the earth and caused the dust to cover the earth, remember, and the dinosaurs. So I think that was probably a lot hotter than we're experiencing now. Um, but that's not to dismiss the fact that it is pretty darn hot i'm in arizona and scottsdale and you know we've had three digit we had three digits for you know, a long time uh i just didn't go outside so i meant to make sure the air conditioning you know was you know and people living in other areas i was concerned about everyone everywhere but bottom line is we don't we haven't talked to the earth so we don't know what the earth's going through remember at the core of the earth is molten mass that's hot and the earth shrugs and sh and shifts and the earth is not the same as it was you know long ago we had continental drift the um earthquakes and and, and volcanoes and all these different um elements and we don't know if it's really humanity that's causing the problems or not we're it's certainly adding to them there's no question about that but the earth is it has its own body and functions and and, and metabolism um, to anthropomorphize it. I think that probably, and this is just from, from my inside information and looking at uh, what's going on with the, the big level of, of com computers and, and corporations, uh, probably will develop the best energy possible. I mean, that is at the forefront for everyone looking at how to get safer, healthier, um, better energy and um, nuclear plants and fission and fusion. And there's a lot of stuff going on, but they're politically incorrect because people think that there's going to be a Chernobyl or something's going to happen and blow up. Um, they're a lot safer than they used to be years ago. So I can't really talk to that because it's not my area of expertise, but just from those who I do speak with, um, I think that people are a lot nicer than we attribute them. And I don't think that some of the big corporations that are putting out the the um, microchips really want to see everyone you know, burn. I don't think aggressive politics is, is ever good. I think that in France, you have your aggression over, um, what is it, a, a two-year or one-year retirement age? Yeah, I didn't, come on, you can work in your 70s if you feel good. And I, I, I was forced into retirement. I didn't want to retire as a university professor, but I reached an age where that, that that's their retirement age. Um, but I'm still teaching. So not everyone who is older wants to retire. In fact, retiring is could be one of the worst things for your health. Um, so I think there's so many different areas here, but the one that you seem to focus on the, the most was the militant. No, I don't think we should ever be militant unless our lives are being threatened. So in Iran, the women what would be the difference of them being militant? They're just going to be shot down and stoned or do they leave the country and go someplace else? Just think if Iran lost all of its women who left Iran and went someplace else to work and prosper, Iran would want 
might change its laws against women, you know, in, in just that regard. Um, and I know that's a big issue there. Um, I think, and I only say this because the first thing is, it's the hottest month ever. And when that was on the news, I went, well, what is your research? How did they know this? What, you know, where are the facts about this? Um, we also had the coldest winter ever, last winter. So these extremes, I think, are what's pushing it. It's not that it's so hot. It's also, it got cold. And the rain in many areas of the world was far more than what was expected. And winters lasted far longer than what was expected. So the bottom line here is what do we do? What can we do? I, I think we need to make our voices heard really loud, but based on facts rather than the hyperbole of the news saying it's the hottest um, temperature ever in the world. We don't know that. We should question that right up front. Um, I wish we had time to work as a group to, you know, do, you know, do due diligence on that and break it down. Who says that? Why did they say it? How do they know? Um, and I highly doubt it's the hottest the earth has ever been. Seeing that, you know, the dinosaurs were killed by dust and the earth was hit by an asteroid. Um, but in modern civilization, over the past, say, if you take the past hundred years, was it extremely hot? Yes. Is that something we should pay attention to? Yes. How do we cool it down? This is where I think more like a futurist than an emotional um, political perspective. I want the technologists, the futurists who are um, smart and have efficacy and, and integrity to help us get out of this pit hole that we're in. You know, I don't like seeing any animal suffering. Uh, I even worried about the, in my yard, I have hummingbirds and um, um, geckos. My husband and I were out putting water out for the geckos. You know, it's, so it's, it's we're all affected by this. And I saw a dead gecko in the swimming pool. We also had a dead bird sitting on, on the, the uh, a part of the pool. It was trying to get water, but it was, it was not quite dead yet, but we had to take it out and, and put it near water to try to help it. So we're all affected by these extreme things. And this is just, you know, here in Scottsdale, which is not in the middle of some jungle or, you know, uh, um, not on the streets for the homeless, you know, so everyone should be concerned and we should be doing everything possible. So it's like the thing with dementia. Why isn't money being spent on that? So yes, we need to, to go back to the moon. Yes, we need to do the satellites and, and the rocket boosters and all of that, but we also need to quit complaining about so much and get busy finding solutions. So if we take, what are most of the stuff complaining about? Um, what, what pronouns we use? I, I don't care. You can call me boy, girl, man, woman. I don't care. That doesn't bother me. But I do respect the fact that people do want certain pronouns to represent who they are and how they identify. However, if we put so much emotional and political emphasis on pronouns, we're leaving out this big area where we need to really focus all of our energy and smarts to solve the problems. Does that make sense? So that's how I think. Some of the, and I think about when I burned my bra in the 1960s and then the play Hair came out, the musical and, you know, Free Love and all that stuff and LSD. You know, it's, I, I was, you know, I took my bra off at university. I was a freshman during that time, 1969, I guess. And it's, you know, freedom. But that was more important to me than things in the world that I ought to have been paying attention to. So you can't get angry at, 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 at the young people for not looking at the bigger picture because it's all a, a point of maturation. It's what's important to you is where you are in your life, right? So I, it's it's a complex thing. Does anyone else have any opinions on this that can share? Okay, uh, Rory and Martin. Yes, I see your hands, go ahead. Whichever. Okay, Rory, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Sure. Hi, Natasha. It's a pleasure. <laughs> to hear you speak on everything. I love your frankness. And I love that you're such an analytical thinker and it's not just a matter of you're presented with information and it comes from a source that you should trust and just trust it. I love like hearing you like elaborate on everything you just talked about so far. 
I have a question. Um, in thinking about the future, I've been thinking about this topic for a very long time. And thinking about, um, you know, my perspective is technology is just a mirror of this reality. And we just borrow from reality to create something new. So nothing's new, really. And when I look at, you know, algorithms, I think about like the algorithms of life that bring you various things and you can either tune into that or you cannot, or thinking about like, um, I'm really into AR, VR and thinking about how like you have something that's right in front of you, but you can only detect it with a tool, right? So there's all these things that like, um, I think about in terms of like my art and like reality and also thinking about the future in terms of like the path we're on. There's many people I think that are like me who are very much into technology, but also have a reverence for nature and the natural world and who, you know, given the opportunity, feel as though it's perfectly fine for other people to have and chart their own course and becoming, you know, more um, integrated with machine. And also like for me, I'm like incredibly spiritual and I like to tap into like the technology that is already like ingrained within me. I feel like there's like this other potential path for humanity to really reflect inwards and be able to uncover what we've kind of forgotten about. But I see like, you know, and you know, more so like, and like, um, you know, the hyperbole you're talking about. Um, things that are put forth about transhumanism and whatnot. Um, I see this like almost conflict, like of budding heads of there will be people who are, you're either on and you're with us or you're not. And I just feel like there has to be this allowance of people to be able to chart their own course. Where do we start having that dialogue and start having like discussion about the ethics and the rules and the ideas about how would we navigate, you know, a future in which people are going to want to decide, because I don't really think that it would be ethical or very advanced for anyone to ever tell anyone, well, kick rocks because you're not with us. You know, you think about like, um, you know, hum humans and like Neanderthals and whatnot, and you think that hopefully we're more advanced than like just wanting to knock someone off. So what are your thoughts on that? Thank you. Oh, I, I love I love your statement. Thank you. I'm, I'm I'm very passionate about this topic. I I always hated anyone telling me what to think and do. I didn't mind constructive criticism, and I didn't mind uh, um, you know. But in my own belief system, you know, I I just that's why I left the church when I did at 18 or 16 I think it was 17 or something like that oh and I I uh, just I just I just so much being told what to think and do I, I want to find out for myself so I explored various religions I went and lived with people you know different Indians and in like the Amazon jungle or the Navajo Indians I I tried to go to different groups and and see how they communicated to understand and what was so obvious to me is is everyone believed that their god was the god and and everyone else was wrong and that was very clear to me from right from the beginning that something's not right even though I didn't have the the intellectual or the, the 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 verbal skills to express it or explore it, I understood something was wrong. Same with politics, you know, it's your right or your left. <laughs> you know, it's it's a same type of belief system. Um, so the, what you're talking about largely is binary thinking. And what I love about transhumanism is the um, the uh, the principle of um, spontaneous order and the principle of uh, continuous change. Um, you may have a certain way of thinking at an age and then you mature and you, or you go through experience or loss or, or grief or whatever, and then you have a different reality based on uh, what, what you've gone through in life. And that's what helps build our morals and our personal morals and, and ethical uh, uh, systems largely. But um, what can we do about it? Just start, I think it's it's, like a grassroots thing you just have to let people go you know do your thing and transhumanism has never except for one person ever said this is the this is the right way to go 
this is the only way to go. And that one person who did it was a, um, a very well-known human being who um, was called the world's genius or whatever. And he was an early transhumanist and he was very strict about things. However, I, who was associated with him, didn't agree because I thought, no, it's people's choices. Do you don't have to be a vegetarian. You don't have to do this. You do what you is best for you. So I saw that dogma early on within a transhumanist and it caused me that was in the 1980s that caused me to rebel and not want to be part of that and so then i found an uh, uh the, the um the the real core transhumanists that was just one person but i found the group of transhumanists that we got together and, and we created the movement but it was always to advance and explore and question our own beliefs um you know is there a god no one knows Many transhumanists are atheists. Some are agnostic. There are Mormon transhumanists, Christian transhumanists, Jewish transhumanists. I'm not atheist. I'm not agnostic. I'm very spiritual, and I have my own views on uh, the rhythm of the world and the and the as you said, like the algorithms in in just life. So it's I, I you know I've always been very spiritual, and um, most of my performance work is in the environment, in volcanoes or nems and jungle, or you know in out at sea in the merchant marines, you know doing different things. Um, so I, I'm in sync with that. Um, so how do, what do we do? We put our foot down. This is where it ties into um, uh, Peoshimi. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. I'm looking. Peoshini. That's where it ties in. Do we become militant about this? This is an area where I'd say we don't become militant, but we become very um, strong about it. No, wrong. You can't do that. And I think the more we speak up when someone's doing that and saying, no, don't push me into a corner. Uh, you know, people want to paint you as, um, you know, one political view, one religious view, or one sexual view, or one whatever you know they they want you to be but uh, i was told all i want to do is be perfect and live forever i said i don't i immortality is not a term i use and i never use it it's a pretty word it has a history to it but i don't know what the future is it may be a future where i don't want to live i don't know but right now this is my view and um and so that's that and it's it probably will be because I love life and I think being in life is great, but I don't know what's on the other side because I haven't been there and no one knows. So um, I think we have to put our foot down very strong, Rory, and just say stop. And I think it's on a one to one basis. It's like that woman who that philosopher who wrote that. I just sent her an email. You know, this is wrong. Don't do this. I didn't say it as rudely as that. I just said, you know, this is misinformation. And why didn't you speak to a woman if you're writing about women and reproduction? You know speak to someone who has you know been through it or has a view on it and um so anyway uh, i i love what you said i agree with you 100 percent. so thank you rory i, I thank I, you I, so much oh you're welcome um, uh, martin you've been so patient there hi hi um one of the things that strikes me about the transhumanist movement is th that much of it involves the technological enhancement of human potentiality. But reminding ourselves of Einstein's dictum of developing technology without the wisdom to know how to handle it, I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that not enough attention has been placed on really understanding what our current abilities are. And I can think of three examples um, that um, that that frame on the question that I'm going to ask, which is um, One, the research by uh, Edwin Hutchins on the navigational ab abilities of Micronesian and Polynesian sailors able to sail outside of land without GPS systems and so forth with a, pretty much a bottom-up as well as a distributed form of navigational cognition. Another example 
would be um, jazz musicians, which are demonstrably able to function um, in ways visible to fMRIs completely differently from, let's say, classical musicians and represent an integration of top-down and bottom-up forms of cognition, which enable them to manipulate very complex sign systems, musical sign systems, uh, without losing the experience of flow. And the third example would be the two periods, um, one in the 60s and 70s, on uh, scientific research on the effects of meditation, uh, first with uh, Indian uh, meditation techniques, and then more recently with uh, techniques associated with Buddhism and mindfulness. Uh, and it seems to me that while we come up with all these particular strategies for enhancing human potential through the means of technology, why isn't there more attention on figuring out how to evolve ourselves? And I'm wondering how much you've paid attention to these things. Uh, and and you know, uh, this is off the cuff, and I'm 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 putting you into into uh, you know uh, a position of having to perform. But but uh, how have you thought about this? Oh no, Mark, I love it. Thank you, uh, Mark Martin Martin Martin. Yeah. Um, Okay. Um, uh, and uh, just one one um, thing, I, I just want to um, uh, bracket this by um, uh, demonstrating self consciousness about the, for example, the Orientalism that people often associate with Western affection for, you know, um, Eastern cultures, for example, um, uh, uh, that we reify them, that we um, uh, uh, imag uh, create imaginary cultures that may not exist uh but i think there's enough empirical evidence to for example in in uh in the research done on meditation that there really is something there that the rest of us need to understand just like my research on jazz musicians suggests that jazz musicians are engaged in cognitive performance that the rest of us really need to understand so now i'm finished okay. sorry oh no good i love that you brought up ed hudgens um, name. <laughs> I work with him, so I, I'm, uh, I value him very much. But it, what I was thinking about the early sailors, um, uh, did they, didn't they have sectants back then? Not, not the Polynesian and, and the Polynesian. Well, there were the stars. So they, um, well, with a sectant, you have to, you know, use it and line it up with the stars, but even following the stars and, you know, that was probably the the key navigational uh, equipment, but there are certain tidal waves, um, not tidal waves, but tides and waves that, right. that push and pull. So there is a yeah, that's the that's the bottom up form of navigational right. cognition, which the right. uh, shamans, which were the navigators, would feel right. the, the swells of the waves. Um, mm -hmm. And whether they're experiencing chop, which would indicate uh, interference patterns created by um, uh, coherent um, uh, waves bouncing off of islands and then coming back. And, and, right, right. Uh, yes. All, so all of that more was actually, yeah, yeah, and that uh, that was actually more important than the uh, the star sightings. Right. So it was a, a, a feel that you get, you become one with it. I know when I went out to sea, I became a merchant marine because I wanted to spend three months out at sea without any land, any interference and see what, how I would feel and work with it as, as a movement, as a, a consciousness thing for me. So uh, the only way I could do it was join the merchant marines and, and, you know, um, but it was, um, you do become one with the sea and it's really interesting you even become a little salty you know you get you you become one and and you see that rhythm so i think that it's it's kind of like an echolation but not echolation that the sailors gain the polynesian sailors and very very similar to the jazz uh players in their their um cognitive rhythmic flow uh, there's a there's a pulse to it the jazz and the unknown part of jazz where you know and then one one musician 
will take a lead and, and go down a journey. And then another one might come up, bounce up against it and pull back and bounce up and then take the lead. So jazz is almost like flight. And, and whoever is leading may not, like birds don't sit around in the morning and go, okay, you're gonna lead the flight. It just happens. It's a symbiotic relationship. Um, but as a, as a research agenda is what I'm talking about. Why aren't transhumanists more? Oh no, I'll, I'll get to that. No, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say, show you that I'm on the same page as far as um, meditation, especially like different types of meditation, transcendental meditation. I've been meditating since I was 18 years old, um, doing transcendental meditation and you know, Shakti Gwan's meditation too. So it's something I do on a daily basis. Um, so. I don't think it's written about enough, probably, but it's certainly there. Um, there's OK, if you think about jazz musicians, take a look at, at some transhumanists who are like in my book. I have 70, I think it's 72 authors who are scholars, if not scholars, then they they invented something or created like AI or <laughs> whatever it is, or like Eric Drexler, nanotechnology, all these. The authors are seminal thinkers in their respective fields. and as a, a, a collection and a connective of thinkers, this is on an intellectual cognitive basis, there's a rhythm that goes on within transhumanists. And it's very much like the jazz musician. We have had some discordant moments, like with Aubrey de Grey and the news about Aubrey. Um, and that was a problem and he's a transhumanist. So then the, mus then the rhythm of the sound goes in a different direction, not defending it, not agreeing with it, but just it's, you know, you just move. It's kind of like flight or going into that state, that om state in meditation. Uh, it is there. It's just not written about in that way. Although I think there have been some, probably in science fiction, Werner Vinge, who's a transhumanist, probably wrote about it. Uh, he came up with the idea of the technological singularity. Uh, Martine Rothblatt, who I mentioned earlier, certainly is within that. I wouldn't call it a hive mind, but I think that the best way would be probably like the like the, the musicians. Um, there is a time in transhumanism where politics got too strong. There is a divisiveness between the socialist and the libertarians. And this awful discordant feeling was uh, was a, a absor it was just awful and it was like oh it was just so awful to, to be around and i had to work double time to to move the movement away from that whereas there were those who'd like to keep it in that that binary discordant uh, arena that uh, referring to rory um you know it, it was there but i think every movement on some level um, no matter if it's political, religious, or otherwise, goes through something where there's someone who wants to take it over and push it in a direction where it's not safe or not good, or it's it's unfounded or just a plain bullshit or a lie. And then the rest have to pull it back and movement. So that is the, and that does happen. I'm thinking about the movie, um, it was jazz. What was that movie about the drum player? Um, um, it was one word. Oh, oh, it was Whiplash. Did you ever see the movie Whiplash? Okay, I thought, remember? I, I thought Whiplash was really interesting because particularly since I write about jazz and cognition, um, it seemed to allegorize the ways, even at the level of pedagogy in the United States, of <laughs> white European dominance of what is largely a bottom-up cognitive process um uh and uh, illustrated the um the uh the column that be top down the hierarchy of it of that pedagogy would just top down i'm the boss well, that's that's white that's white european dominance of jazz education in in the academy uh, uh and it it exemplifies really the fact that jazz is a balance of top down and bottom up forms of cognition and what the the uh, the student drummer and the conductor were engaging in was allegorizing that tension mm -hmm. uh and demonstrating how toxic um uh top down control can be to creative processes 
Yeah, but jazz, but jazz is not strictly bottom up. It's an integration of bottom right, up. Right, exactly. And I see transhumanism like that, mind you. Um, there, for all the criticisms on transhumanism, there has never been a transhumanist. Okay, let's go through the criticism so I can show you that there is that jazz movement, since that's the language that I think. Mo I, I could use dance too, uh, a dancer. It's, it's the, you know the movement, a flow of dance. But um, okay, a lot of criticisms. You just want to live forever, and no, no one want to live as long as healthy as possible. Okay, number two, you, you're elitist. You're all elitist. Excuse me, I work. <laughs> you know, you know, I didn't want to stop teaching. I reached the retirement age for the university. You know, it's so that which was seventy years old, and I was told, well, you're retiring. That's the way it is. So it's not every person wants to do what these things okay another one is let's say just want to be perfect okay perfect there's no such thing as perfection no transhumanist wants to be perfect why because when you reach a level of perfection there's no place to go the whole point is to keep on learning and evolving to questioning to be critical thinkers critical thinking is at the core of transhumanism along with visionary thinking a uh, number let's find another one um i know one um one magazine came out saying that we're all a bunch of Jewish wealthy elitists who want to take over the world. Why on earth would, okay. Yeah, some are Jewish, some are, who cares? I mean, why pin a, a, a pigeonhole? That was, elitist, I don't know, um, maybe because association with Peter Thiel of PayPal or uh, Elon Musk of, you know, Tesla or Ray Kurzweil of, you know, Kurt, uh, you know talk about most, you know, synthesizers, the, the Kurtzwell synthesizer, or maybe Martine Rothblatt, who is very, very wealthy because of Sirius Radio and all of her endeavors that are so successful and brilliant. They are not, they are the most generous, loving, kind people. I know them all personally, except for Elon Musk, I do not know personally, but lovely, kind people. Um, so what is this elitist? Okay, you just want, you're the haves, and then you don't care about the rest of the world, the have-nots. Whoever said that, I've never heard a transhumanist say, we want to have everything in the hell with everyone else. Never, ever have I, no. Uh, transhumanists are very, basically, they're they're largely, most are humble and, and, and kind. Um, there's some assholes, to be sure. You know, there's assholes everywhere, and there's bullshit, to be sure. There's bullshit everywhere. But the core of... The people that why I, I like being in the community so much, I'm with my colleagues. They're, I call them colleagues because they are colleagues and family. Uh, it's because we challenge each other and, and we want to solve problems. Uh, what's I think the main thing is you're elitists uh, who just want to live forever and take over the world. N nothing could be further from the truth. But I wish, I, I, anyway, so it, it's just ridiculous nonsense. Um, the technology technological singularity. We just want the technological singularity to happen so we can upload and become bodiless agency in some computational system. Uh, that's what uh, Catherine Hale said um, in her book, um, How We Became Post-Human and, and Catherine Hales, you know, I've debated her in, in our book and especially in transhumanism and its critics. And she said, okay, I was wrong, you know, transhumanism was gonna be around. I, you know, people say these things that are, are really strange. So no, the idea of uploading was, it's been around for a long time. Um, certainly we, um, the, the goal is to back up our memory and to transfer our brain into computational systems or whatever system is the safest and most secure for memory backup with a high level of dementia, that would be common sense. I mean, we back up our computers, we back up our messages, we back up, you know, I make sure that in my home, you know, and my electrical system is working and, you know, these things. So it's, it's just common sense that if dimensions on the rise, we really want to back up our memories, you know, and that, you know, we have videos, we have photography, photography started up as a duplicating so we'd have memories. These are just common sense things, but they're not awful things. And as far as AI is concerned, and um, we want to integrate with AI, yes, you bet your bottom dollar. And that is true. We do want to integrate, I don't mean we, but humans are integrating with AI, narrow AI. It's in our refrigerators, it's in our smartphones, it's in our automobiles, it's in everything that we use, narrow AI. Not 
strong AI or AGI, but narrow AI is in most of the tools that we use. <clears throat> And so it's, it's already around us. So the, then the issue there becomes, do we want to become post-human, um, superhumans, uh, more intelligent, smarter? Well, I would love to be more intelligent. Yes, yes, indeed. At, this, at the risk of other people um, not being included? Heavens no, there's nothing in transhumanism that says this is only for the rich elite transhumanists. Nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. So when you, um, okay, so now getting back to the main thing here, I just wanted to, to parse that out. There is a type of jazz or symphony or dance that goes, not symphony, a jazz or dance that goes on in, in when you have a room or a conference of very um, passionate people about their field. I've done it in the arts. Um, I've seen it in, in the film industry. Uh, when I was doing that, and, and writers, uh, working with writers and you know, having sessions, uh, it, it's all part of, of the critique. So I think that while maybe it maybe maybe that's something that needs to be considered, you know, Martin and and Rory and Peoshimi, what you've all said needs to be maybe broadened and made core to um uh the movement, I, I don't think anyone would dispute it. I think every, people would would want it. Um, the, the, the main thing is um, looking for a better world. I, it, what we've got isn't good enough. I'm sorry, the war in Ukraine, the problems in Iran, now going on with China and all these, these areas of manipulation and, and false tea and, and people being hurt and um, treated badly. Why is that still happening? You know, it's it's it just mind boggles me, and it's it's about top down rather than bottom up. It's about the top down hierarchy of 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 um, uh, uh, autocracy about authoritarian rulers. For example, in, in the news this morning, I was watching it. Um, there has been in what country was it? Maybe it was Iran. Yes, it was a woman on CNN, I think it was, or MSNBC, talking about how in Iran there hasn't been, there's no democracy, but there the, the same rulers have been in charge and don't let anyone else take over. And no matter what people do, they stay in charge. And um it's it's just a shame. It's awful. But transhumanism is absolutely opposed to the authoritarian rule of sequestering people to to um, have their rights um, questioned. So um, one, one thing is morphological freedom, which is a principle of transhumanism. I think sometimes people might get that wrong. What it means, basically, it's, it's more like a political right. And what it means in the simplest terms are you have the right to enhance your body, your mind, as you choose, a person who doesn't want to enhance has the right never to be coerced to enhance. And enhance means anything, contact lenses, stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, um, any, any, you know, uh, maybe an artificial limb if you lose your leg. If you don't want to have that artificial limb, that roboticized um, haptic system uh, leg, then, you know, you can stay, you don't have to have it. And so uh, I think that's important that, that the, the human or the transhuman rights are more important than anything, not to be coerced, to have your liberty, your freedom and your identity. I hope I, I parsed that out carefully, Martin. Did I? Thank you very much. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for, for bringing that to my attention. I think more needs to be espoused on that. Anyone else? Oh, uh, yeah, Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, th thank you very much for your talk. Uh, this week, I just started to read uh, David Rogan's Post Human Life. So uh, I, I was very, very happy to, to hear this in, in the same uh, direction. And I have three questions, uh, which I wrote. So I'm, I'm going to put it in the chat. And I'm going to read them so that they uh, are clearer. Okay. Um, 
Oh, 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 I didn't see the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, I, I, I'm copy pasting them on the chat, and I will read. I will do them when I when I finish. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, so, so my first question is at the level of norms, values, and social objects which emerge on or practice and performativity but are not directly embodied, such as institutions which turn effective the second nature of society, which novelties can be foreseen in a transhuman context, which normative and institutional changes are needed for and which become possible in a transhuman society. My, my second uh, commentary or question is that I remember an exposition by Adam Saretsky uh, in Mexico in which he argued for making explicit the aesthetic motivations in transhumanism and not limiting to the enhancement of values, of values inspired in, in a superhero vision of the human, such as being uh, stronger in every sense, which Saretsky associates with militarism. Uh, he he rejects uh, aspiring to being always stronger and better, uh, and he sees it uh, as a militarist uh, aspiration. And the third third comment is that I'm also worried about the conservative use of humanist discourse in politics, which makes a uh, rhetoric use of essentialism, and is one of the sources of distortion in the understanding of the transhuman. Uh, it, of course, ignores the role of education in creating something more than human. And biotechnology in agriculture is also depicted as some kind of technological colonization. Uh, that, that are my comments. Okay, so let's take it number one first. At the level of norms, so I was, okay. Which emerge, okay. <laughs> Which novelties can be foreseen in a transhuman context? Which normative and institutional changes are needed for? Well, I think that anything that's dealing with um, <clears throat> normalcy or normative needs to be challenged because norms are placing a, um, a box around what people are supposed to be. That's what norms are. They, they take an average of what is accepted as being the norm, right, quote unquote. And um, Professor Andy Maya uh, has been working on this for years with his Beyond Normal um, event that used to take place in Liverpool. I'm not sure where it is now, but uh, he's very um, involved in human enhancement in the future. He's brilliant, brilliant academic. Again, his name is Andy Maya. Important person to know about and read his work. He's one of the first to write about human enhancement in an in a academic art book. <clears throat> Um, so um, I think any type of normalcy is, 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 can be challenging. I think that values are extremely important, but I don't think there has to be some level of what's accepted as a norm. I understand that. And, but I think that needs to not be so black and white or binary as we already discussed. It needs to have, you know, not so sequestered to one way or the other as being right or wrong. And the same with values. People's values change over time. Values are not written in stone. Uh, today, we accept certain things that we didn't accept 100 years ago. And hopefully in Iran, that women will be accepted to have their you know, particular rights. In some countries, women you know, want to go to school where they're not being allowed to, or gays are not allowed to practice their you know, sexual proclivities. You know, these, it's, it's so bizarre that what is not normal is a man and a woman uh, being monogamous for it's uh, from what 12 years old or 15 20 whenever they uh, have their first sexuality to the rest of their life that's that was considered a norm in some areas of the world and what's also very interesting too is that in the different countries or societies of the world the norms are different not everyone's norms are the same so we have to get away from the western world's norms or normalcy and values and understand other values some people um some tribes in in areas, you know, don't have any problems eating dogs. You know, certain countries. Some people don't have any problem eating other people. Cannibalism. These were all norms in different areas of the world. You know, early Greek men had young Greek boys. I mean, it's so. These are all things that were considered normal, but in certain societies. So we have to figure out 
what society the norm the norm is is accepted in. So in the Western world, there are certain norms that we're breaking down through um, a lot of the LS. Uh, um, let's just say that the different gender specific uh, gay and lesbian feminism, um, Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, all these different groups. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, my, my question is a bit more on the social ontology side. Um, I, I can't uh, reformulate it as how, how will a social ontology of the transhuman uh, look like? Oh, okay. Well, it, uh, pretty much like everyone else. It's not that different. You know, I'm a transhuman and uh, my values are very high level. I don't like lying or cheating or stealing or you know hurting and intentionally hurting other people i i you know stay away from that so the norms for for transhumans would be that no judgment you know and i think that rory said that <clears throat> you know just let people be who they are that's the norm for a transhuman you know just allow and accept people to be who they want to be as long as they don't hurt anyone else i think that is the parameter as long as you don't hurt someone else intentionally or damage the environment or other life forms, you know, that's your norm. OK, so there is no descriptive of what it's supposed to be and the values. The second part, Adam Zaretsky, he was a little bit out outside the transhumanist scope. Um, he used transhumanism for his own art, and that's OK. Um, um, at a taboo transgression transcendence in art and science session, which he argued that making explicit the aesthetic motivation in transhumanism and not limiting to enhancement values. Well, I don't know what he's talking about because um, the aesthetic motivation in transhumanism is not li limited to enhancement of values. It, it, transhumanism is not a social with military and militarism. So I don't, could you explain what he was talking about? He's a little bit outside the scope. Yeah, he, he uh, was trying to criticize uh, the imaginaries of, of, of making a, a perfect human or, or yeah, he criticizes the notion of enhancement uh, as, uh, as being a, uh, 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 reificative or, or 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 being in line with uh, socially accepted uh, values or pre previously accepted values, and he he was addressing the the ima imaginaries of of uh, becoming uh, perfect to. So I already mentioned perfect. There's no perfect. He's yeah. totally wrong. Period. The end. He's wrong. He got it wrong, and he used that to build his own thesis and it's it's inaccurate shame on him there is no perfection in transhumanism yeah, and there's yeah, no I, yeah I, yeah I, I maybe just uh, misinterpreted no you're not I, I I'm aware of uh, where I'm aware of his work from many years ago he was okay. kind of out there he was a biohacker DIYer who he seemed like a nice guy so no criticism of him but his work was always trying to be a little it was it was outside the realms of of i'd have to google him and see what he's doing now but no that's wrong um i think that he is picking up the postmodernist rhetoric that anti-transhumanist and and um so he's he's using it to get mileage he's misrepresenting it so that's my answer he's wrong <laughs> period the end yeah so. okay thank you Okay, so the third thing, I'm also worried about the conservative use of humanistic discourse and politics. Ignores the role of education creating something more than human. Oh, okay, so the third one, um, what do you mean by humanist discourse and politics? Uh, for instance, in, in Mexican politics, uh, the officialistic uh, populist government uh, has invented something called Me Mexican humanism, 
uh, which is just a, a conservative uh, a traditional discourse uh, in, in which the, the traditional uh, social relations of power are cemented, and it, which is a, a conservative ideology. And they are uh, against uh, tra transgenic uh, corn, for instance, uh, and, and against transgenic science. Uh, and I'm worried about the, that kind of, of uses of, of humanism. Okay. Um... I'm not familiar with humanism and politics other than humanism looking at the liberty of humans. Um, humanism is a very old worldview or a very old philosophy. Um, and it got some things right and some things wrong. Um, that, um, or I should say got some things right and some things that, that were very, that didn't advance. Um, but sort of distortion of understanding transhumanism it of course ignores the role of education creating something more than human. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about the uh, Habermas slaughter debate on on the norms for the human park. The what? There was a debate uh, among uh, Habermas and Peter slaughter in, in the among the on the publication of norms for a human park. Of humans, who I'm, I'm not uh, sure of what the translation is in English. Um, um, uh, could you write that in the chat? I don't quite understand. There is a debate between who? Oh, Habermas. Okay. Um. So neither one are experts in transhumanism, although Habermas has written a lot. Okay. Well, um, I don't know if the humanist vision is conservative. How is it conservative? Uh, by, by the reification of essentialist uh, pictures of the human. Okay. Oh, okay. In other words, Habermas says the human is supposed to look like this, and this is what a human is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As, but that's true. I mean, uh, evolution-wise, a human is a human is a human. You know, you, you can't make a human something other than it is by evolution. You know, so I may not agree with Habermas, but I think that, that a, now it's not a vision, but a human is a human. You can't get around that. It, it 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 evolved um, as a species. It's a a fact. Um, there's a certain biology that goes with human. There's certain genes. There's the 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 genome of a human is a human. Uh, so you can't now now who is us who is Stoller Dijic and what what is his or her position? Uh, yeah. Uh, Peter Sloterdijk in, in Norms for the Human Park uh, was uh, advocating for for the public uh, debate on on biotechnology. Okay, so what you're saying is that that using biotechnology to alter the human um, was the argument, and Habernas was very conservative, saying we shouldn't alter the human. Is that right? Okay, so Habernas is correct in that a human is a human. He's incorrect in that a human can't be modified. Okay, so, okay, I, now I got it. Habernas is looking at the biopolitics of body, of biology. The, the biopolitics, he's being a conservative in that realm saying that we shouldn't alter the human genome or the human being. And we've already been altering the human. So Habernas is very conservative in that way. Um, you're, you, we both have eyeglasses on and um, Sebeda has a headset on. All these are alterations to humans. So, um, but, in, but it, there comes a hard line with many bioethicists, which Habernas is. 
and um, where we shouldn't alter the, the genes of the human, but we've already been altering them, that CRISPR-Cas9 um, was done in nature. It wasn't human made, it was um, an organelle did that and it was discovered by a human and we copied um, the what was being done in nature and started doing it in human. So that's a good debate. So your concern is that transhumanism would be distorted or misunderstood because of Habernas's conservative view on what a human is supposed to be. And we shouldn't mess with biotechnology. Is that correct? Yeah, th that kind of that uh, uh, branch of discourses of, of the human, of, of of conservative pictures of the human uh, used uh, in, in current politics. Yeah, it is in is it is in current politics, but I think that when it gets to someone's life, like if if there is, if you have a child and that child has um, a disease that's located in the gene, and or has a um, a bad protein that could send a message to a gene to cause a mutation, a horrific disease. Most people, by and large, unless they're a Christian scientist or their religion prevents it, would go and have gene therapy. By and large, um, most people would do it. And it has nothing to do with politics. So when it gets down to human emotion, politics step aside. I mean, Habernas can say whatever he wants, but if his child was suffering from a gene mutation or he himself or his wife or, or you know, you know, when it comes close to our family and home and our loved ones, our kind of politics step aside. Does that make sense? So the more people who want to be, if they have a gene and need biotechnology to alter the, their genetic makeup, they will have it done. And we see this all the time. Remember the first test tube baby? That was in 1978. And at that time in 1978, that test tube baby, which was a girl and she was con conceived in a pe Petri dish and then injected into the woman's uterus and the woman became pregnant. That was all done with biotechnology. And there was an uproar in politics. And um, the, the doctor who did this work, it was in, in England, um, his life was threatened. And the woman who was pregnant through this, um, early IVF or uh, infertility um, methodology what was you know, criticized and you know, her life threatened. And there were journalists in the newspapers and magazines saying that this baby would not be a human. It was something other, it was disgusting and immoral and unethical and it was just awful. Well, today the, the truth is that there are over five to six million people on our planet who were conceived in a Petri dish and we accept them as humans, as normal, right? So what was once a value or a belief or normal changes over time and biotechnology is one way that changes. So while Habernas may be saying we shouldn't do any gene editing and we should keep, stay with our human genome and our genetics, uh, people will, if I had a gene for Speaking of dementia, if I had the Alzheimer's gene, which is a gene, and it, according to the research, the gene and a protein that the messaging, I would have it removed immediately, no matter what cost. So people, and but that's me, you know. But most people will will do. You know how many the infertility business is such a major, major field of research and development investment. It's a big business. So, and again, in the 1960s, 70s, that was considered immoral, unethical, and not natural. And today, most women go to a gynecologist and they're on hormone replacement therapy, or they use contraceptions. Uh, men get, have, who have um, erectile dysfunction have a drug for it, or you know, have some prosthetic they can use to uh, remain hard during a sexual act. So people may, it may be bad until, all of a sudden the mainstream wants it. And I think that this is kind of sums everything up that while change, the unknown seems so scary and we place our morals and values 
on what we considered acceptable or normal. But once we get to a position where, uh uh-oh, I have to make a choice. And sometimes that choice is different than what is within the scope or the box of our own values or morals or normal. We shift, you know? So I love your questions. Those were great. Hello from Trinity College, Dublin. That's Elaine. Okay. Did I help with that, Daniel, at all? Uh, yeah, yeah. It, uh, yeah, it it's one in, in a different uh, way, but, but it, it was uh, very clear. Uh, I it also helped me to to reconsider the, how, how seriously I should take, take Saretsky, which he obviously does not want to be taken seriously himself, but, but I, I shouldn't do it either. Yeah, yeah and Adam Zaretsky, I remember him from years ago. He was doing all sorts of really weird stuff. And I remember he sent me something. Uh, I included him in one exhibition I did of transhumanist art, but it was, but he went too far in a direction that, um, was not interesting aesthetically to me. And so it looks like then he went into another direction where he's saying transhumanists just wanna be perfect and blah, 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 it's militaristic. He's absolutely wrong. There is no, and that may be an attack at me and that's okay. Um, I designed Primo Post Human. I never designed the perfect body. I have just a design of a future human that's that um, that is a whole body prosthetic. That is the engineering of it is through artificial intelligence, haptic systems, robotics, nanotechnology, um, you know, biocompatible um, systems, whatever. But I never said everyone has to look like this. It was just like a, a template. Then you could do what you wanted with it. And I still think that one day we will have a whole body prosthetics that our biological bodies um, will be for this biosphere and then other environments like out in space or, you know, have avatars in virtual art. Of- um, 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 artificial realities, virtual realities, enhanced augmented realities, um, gamification, and worlds and metaverses yet to be really designed and developed um, will have different types of bodies for different environments, different substrates. So there is no one perfect body for each substrate. It's, you know, you should be able to do design your body as you want like we choose the clothes we want to wear or the hairstyle we like you know the type of glasses we choose so maybe you're you're short like me i'm petite in in this biosphere maybe i want to be tall in virtual world so i'd want a taller of uh, form envelope for my consciousness so i think that too much emphasis is put on the body and not enough emphasis put on our consciousness or our brains. And this kind of uh, plays to what Martin was asking about consciousness and and in his beautiful expose about the jazz musicians and whatnot. Yeah, so it's like live and let live, you know, <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I also uh, want, wanted just to make clear that, that my first question on the social ontology side was on a on a frame of an emergentist frame uh, in which the sociality is an emergent uh, dim- dimension of, of being uh, above above the biologic life but, but that's uh, on the on the philosophy i'm working on which is uh, lukaku social ontology and, and that is uh, just, just seeing the social as, as an emergent strata of, of being, and, and maybe that was my the reason my my question where, what was uh, what was uh, understood as it was. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's an important area to be sure. Thank you. see what time it is it's almost noon does anyone else have questions comments hey natasha i have a question for you you have mentioned your um your get together like every friday did you say like how would we be able to sign up for that okay um the best way 
is to sign up here. That's why I have this up here largely. And wow. if you go, if you go to Transhuman Studies, um, you can sign up for free. And mm -hmm. then um, let's see if we, we do it. Um, uh, I says you, if you sign up for Transhumanist, how do you do this? If you go to the website here, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, let me just get this. If you sign up here, again, you don't have to take the course, but if you just sign up for it here, then when it says email opt in or opt out, don't opt out. Okay. So if you opt out, that means you won't get the email, but every week I send an email to the various groups I'm with, and I always send it to Transhuman Studies, everyone who has not opted out of receiving email. And I don't send a lot of emails, so it's, it's not like I'm advertising, I don't. I just do that once a week about the course with the Zoom link, it's via Zoom. And um, yeah, uh, next Friday, there will, I'll be in New York City speaking at the Lifespan IO conference. Okay. Uh, so I don't, I may hop in for a minute, um, but I, um, I'm not sure if I'll be able to from, I have to figure about, yeah, I'll be at the conference. So it'll be later in New York. Yeah. So I think next Friday I have to, I'll send out an email saying that we won't have it because I'll be at, in New York city, but, but do go to the website here, um, that I put in the, yeah, teachable and, um, just sign, sign up again. You don't have to pay for the course. If you don't want you, you don't have to take it, but you will get an email if you opt in. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. I can stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. And thanks to those, everyone here and those who ask questions. I really love them. So yeah. always engage. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for hosting this and your wonderful project. Wow, for an object, love it. It's brilliant.